Hey everybody. Welcome to our week six pre-recorded lecture for Taiji and Qigong here in the spring of 2021. Thanks for taking the time to watch this in advance of our class on Thursday. Um, the topic on the syllabus this week is um, a new concept that we've touched on just a little bit called jings in Taiji. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. We'll talk a little bit about this. Um, so the idea of a jing in Taiji is basically um, some sort of felt experience that you have while doing Tai Chi, right? Or Qigong also. So we already talked about this idea of Peng Jing. And the Jing that we're talking about here is sometimes, uh, actually, let me go to the next slide here. Um, we can think about it as a flavor of Qi, right? And so we, I, uh, I think either week one or week two, I talked about Peng Jing, which is this sort of filling energy that we can put into our bodies. Um, and um, this is a really important part of our Taiji practice. It's one of the ways that we start to uncover some of the subtlety inside a Taiji practice that makes it not just a choreography, which means like put this arm here and this arm here and this leg here and this leg here, step to this direction, do this move three times before doing the next move. All of that is great. And uh, actually the research shows us that even if we just practice Taiji um, a little bit, I'll say mindlessly, where we're just going through the motions, so to speak, it still has tremendous benefits for our health because it's designed so that it thoroughly moves our entire body. And even if we don't have a degree of subtlety inside of our experience of doing Taiji, the act of moving our body, trying to figure it out, moving all the joints of the body, keeping certain basic alignments together, stepping in different directions, making these motions on a regular basis with our body will do really great things for our circulation, for our joint health, for our psycho-emotional balance, right? And this is substantiated by research. And this is one of the reasons that there's so much positive research coming out um, about the health benefits of a practice like Taiji. Even if we look at these courses that folks are doing or the practices that people are actually doing and seeing that they're not terribly um, uh, deep. And by deep, I mean, there's not a high degree of differentiation within their own felt experience. Of course, we need to talk to somebody, but we can also see by the way somebody does uh, a movement if there's a uh, sort of a more superficial or deeper level of felt experience within that, right? So most of the folks uh, in this class are Taiji beginners, and that's a great place to be. We love, the, we love the idea of a Taiji beginner's mind, right? Coming to the movements fresh, trying to figure them out without sort of a lot of conceptual overload. Um, but as Chinese medicine students, we need to have a little bit more depth of theory um, because that will inform how we make these practices relevant to our medicine and then how we can also sort of look at the movements that we're learning and um, recognize the depth of the teaching around this. And the reason that I like to bring this in is that, you know, you're all students here at the Academy of Chinese Culture and Health Sciences. And I know that there's a certain, in every student body, there's a certain number of folks that wanna come in and they wanna learn acupuncture and only acupuncture. And they wanna learn why acupuncture is good from a very strict biomedical perspective, sort of a modern Western adaptation of acupuncture. Maybe they had a great experience with a physical therapist or a chiropractor in a different state. Um, with an acupuncture technique. Um, but because we are here in the Academy of Chinese Culture and Health Sciences, I wanna be really, really, really diligent about saying, hey, acupuncture is not just this thing that we can pluck and practice without relating it to the East Asian culture that it emerged from and this network of meanings, relationships, and depth that will be lacking if we just say that, okay, acupuncture is this practice where we take a needle you know, of this given dimension, I don't know, maybe, you know, 0.30 by 20 millimeters or something like that. And we stimulate this anatomical location, which we could describe anatomically as like, you know, proximal to the, you know, this carpal bone or something like that, and not even use Chinese culture, Chinese cultural reference to actually explain what we're doing. You can still get a really good effect. I mean, the, the, the dry needling and trigger point needling that have sort of emerged in recent years in these um, more biomedical orientations of using acupuncture tools to provide treatment are also very effective. And maybe now we kind of put those in the realm of orthopedic acupuncture as opposed to more traditional acupuncture or classical acupuncture, right? They're very effective and we can use those and I do use those every day in my clinic, but it's important that we look and see that, okay, we can't just cherry pick if we really want to have the depth of um, meaning and also the, the, the best chance of facilitating results in our patients. It's best if we observe these things in the full context where they came from. 
So when we're learning our Taiji practice, yes, we can go and we can do these things sort of mechanically, right? We can you know, say, okay, well, this move is left foot forward, left hand high, right hand low, facing forward. And the next move is right hand high, right foot forward, facing to the right. You know? And the next move is the weight shifts and now the hand turns. You know, we can describe it like that, we can do it like that and we still get a great result but we're missing the layer of depth that's there. And the layer of depth there is this energetic feeling. Um, and I will say straight off the bat that probably the biggest challenge of teaching this class remotely as opposed to being in person with you all is that I don't have the opportunity to give you a direct experience of what it feels like for somebody that has a little bit more um, familiarity with this material to do the movements and then feel some of this on your body, like feel what this actually feels like when you push against somebody who's holding a pung posture and feel that, it, oh, it's not like pushing against a wood frame, mm -hmm. but it's also not like pushing against something that's um, really mushy. It's something that feels like a buoyant energy filling the body, a sense of pliability and flexibility, but also fullness, right? And this nonverbal experience is a jing, sometimes called a jin. So we say this is an energetic feeling or flavor. And in our Tai Chi practice, over time, we're looking to adapt a sensibility to these different sense experiences that we have while doing this form or that we can have while doing this form. In the beginning of our practice, these sense experiences can be very elusive, which is why we do things like standing posture like we did last time, where you just kind of hold this posture and feel what your body feels like. Over time, by developing this sort of pungjing, this filling energy, we can start to notice that there's different energetic movements in our body and it stops being esoteric. It just starts to be a direct experience that like, okay, there's some sense of energy that's filling if I go like this. And then there's another sense of energy that's receiving when I kind of close in towards my body and absorb. And if somebody's pushing on you, you can feel a, a real difference between when somebody's holding this Peng Jing and there's like, oh, there's sort of this firm resilient pressure versus what the one I'm talking about, it's the fourth one on this slide, which is um, Lu, which is receiving or neutralizing a rollback move where the pressure comes in and you absorb it, all right? So my expectations of each individual in this class, each indiv individual student to, to actually grasp these jings um, is not so important. I'm gonna give you a simple exercise to practice where you can start to play with them. But until you're with somebody in person to receive this transmission, and I'll talk about that for in a second, um, actually kind of capturing these jings, it may be a little bit elusive. And I wanna emphasize that even if we do the Taiji form just sort of mechanically, um, if we do it with persistence, these will start to emerge. And if we have the concepts to hang them on, then we're prepared for this, right? We're prepared to look for four basic energies that we can find in our Taiji form. So Peng filling the body with a buoyant energy while retaining pliability. This is sometimes called the ward off because you're holding a space where you're keeping somebody out of your space, out of your energy, right? Um, the second one is G, which is an expression, a forward expression of force, sometimes called press, right? And we see this in the beginning of our form, and we'll see this in push hands when you move somebody off their center and you apply a little bit of pressure. This is our, our G, our forward press, right? Then we have Liu, which is um, receiving and neutralizing, rolling back. Uh, a force comes into your sphere and you, with your sensitivity, and we'll talk about Tingjing, which is listening, energetic listening, you receive that force and neutralize it so that it doesn't actually hit your center, right? And then we have on, which is sort of a, a pushing downwards motion. Uh, it's similar to G with a little bit of a different vector involved. So we have these four energies and we'll do an exercise together where we can play with them a little bit. Um, I also wanna just say that uh, if you are a, not planning on being a martial artist, not planning on engaging people with two person Taiji exercises, which is fine. Although I advise everybody to try it at some point. Um, we can think about these concepts of how we deal with energy um, in a very broad context, right? So Peng is holding your space, right? Peng is holding your space. G is an expression, right? Where you do an expression of energy. It's a little bit of an assertion. It's a yang motion, right? And so is Peng in a, in a lot of ways. Peng can be, Peng is actually balanced, right? Yin and yang. Um, although we'll see in our diagram here, ward off is shown as three yang because it doesn't yield, right? Um, and then we see uh, Liu is receiving and neutralizing. And actually this, this happens frequently when we're, um, talking to our patients, we need to find an energetic posture that's very, very receptive and neutralizing, right? Especially if somebody's having an emotional day or they're in a lot of pain and we need to find a place in ourselves where we can receive that and neutralize it without it kind of going into us and making us feel depleted or uncomfortable or anything like that, where we maintain a center and make a space for that expression without countering it, right? It's just sort of receiving and neutralizing. And then on is sometimes also a little bit more of a more um, 
expressive energy where we're looking to change somebody's situ somebody else's situation at a strategic time, right? So we can think about these very broadly and we'll do an exercise where we actually do these physically um, together, but it also brings us to this idea of transmission and what is transmission. And what I found is that some folks have uh, no idea of what transmission might be. And some folks have very rigid ideas of what transmission is. I'm gonna talk about what, um, after studying this stuff for a while, sometimes within formalized lineages, sometimes outside of them, what, what I've sort of come to think of transmission. So um, we do need to have a little note on lineage and transmission. In, our, in your first homework assignment for the class, the first or second, I asked you guys to go back and say, okay, what is the lineage of Wu style? Where did this come from? And again, this is a way to embed the practices we have in culture and history, right? So we're not just cherry picking what we think will be useful, but actually trying to um, put these into the context of a real history of people and culture, right? And so we learned that the Wu, Wu family came through the Yang family, came through the Chun family, and then it kind of receded into the legendary past of like where Taiji might have come from. And this is very appropriate, right? Um, a personal transmission would be me showing you a chart that says, well, this is me, and these are my teachers, and this are their teachers, and this is their teachers. And if you, know, if you are my student, then you are people learn, learning from me, and this is a formal lineage, right? This is um, a formal lineage. For our purposes right now, we actually don't need to hold this super hard. And there's a big discussion about what transmission and lineage mean within the um, sort of uh, East Asian cultural community as it moves into the West um, and recent cultural history of China. Um, one of my teachers, uh, Liu Ming, who is a Euro-American who received formal discipleship in a number of different East Asian traditions, he, he was very, um, circumspect about how he described his relationship to lineage. And this is a gentleman that had been through the formal lineage reception ceremony in multiple traditions. Um, and the way that he emphasized that we think about it is, is, is sort of the ancestry of your teaching. Like where did your teaching come from? You know, who and where did it come from? And that keeps it embedded in culture and keeps us from um, appropriating the parts of it that we think serves our current needs and um, puts those in the context of trying to um, at least recognize uh, some of the history of where this came from and understand that that informs why it is that we do certain things. There's um, formal disciple ceremonies that can happen in different traditions. And this is true of a lot of Taiji traditions where you do a Baishu disciple ceremony and you know, your teacher says, I have received a lineage from these people and I am now recognizing you as somebody who can also um, represent and maintain this lineage, maintain the authenticity, integrity of a teaching. And very importantly here, um, formal disciples are not folks necessarily that have the highest degree of skill in the performance of these teachings, but rather have the willingness to engage in propagating this teaching and doing there's a ritual maintenance involved in any kind of real tradition where you recognize not only the teachers that have come before you living and dead ones, but the tutelary deities, the, the um, supernatural forces that are, are, uh, part of every tradition that comes from uh, East Asia that's been around for you know more than 60 years or something like that. Um, there was a reaction in modern history from when the, the communists came into power and um, really did their best via this horrible episode of history that you may or may not know much about called the Cultural Revolution where they tried to stamp out anything that looked like the old, right? Anything that looked feudal, anything that looked spiritual, anything that wasn't a materialistic understanding of the universe because that was their, their prerogative, right? It was this materialist doctrine of communism and stamp, stamping out um, injustices, uh, perceived and not perceived, um, uh, that the traditional arrangements of society had created. And um, obviously it's a long discussion about, you know, which of these needed to go and which of these needed to stay. but in the um, expatriate community that left China in reaction to the Cultural Revolution and brought things like Taiji, Qigong and Chinese medicine to the East and via Hong Kong, Taiwan, San Francisco, stuff like that. There was a reactionary period where they said, oh my goodness, our lineages, our, our teaching ancestries are literally being exterminated. And they put a new emphasis on the fact that discipleship is very important, that handing on, these, handing on these traditions with a very formalized focus was very important because they saw the threat of these, of literal extermination um, facing them. So the generation of teachers that taught people my age um, were perhaps more preoccupied with preserving formal lineages and formal discipleships than um, many of these traditions had for the several hundred years um, preceding that.
right? So that's just a little bit of context and why some people really, really put a heavy emphasis on discipleship um, and lineage and transmission and things like that. Um, nothing we're doing here has much to do with lineage, except for the fact that, you know, I want everyone to recognize that these teachings don't come out of any, don't come out of nowhere. They come from an ancestry of people that are teaching these to each other. Um, and uh, the reason I brought it up today is because there, this idea of transmission, this direct nonverbal experience of a jing or a teaching from a senior practitioner is something that um, I'll talk about, but not something that we can necessarily um, absorb the full depth of in the context of this class, right? Because we're not in person. And I mean, I can look on the screen and I can see that some folks are, are getting a little bit of the feeling and that's really what we're talking about, getting a little bit of feeling of these practices, but it's a little bit different than an actual direct transmission. I also just wanna um, caution anybody uh, who encounters a teaching where they overemphasize lineage and transmission and they hand out transmission as a special prize or lineage as a special prize. Um, this is great for constructing multi-level marketing schemes. Um, and it's great for sort of corralling people into areas where they no longer look at the rest of the stuff that's out there, but become very sort of siloed in their own experience, their own lineage and their own tradition. Um, it's an effective way of preserving specific practices. So I, I will give it credit for that, but I also just want to um, perhaps give everyone a note of caution uh, around uh, schools that emphasize this too much, traditions that emphasize too much while balancing this, of course, with the recognition that we don't wanna recreate Qigong or Taiji for ourselves because it's already been done, right? We can borrow from these um, lineages of teachings, uh, see their best practices, recognize what we need to preserve and also recognize what we may need to adapt. Um, the modern preoccupation with making everything your own little individual expression is fine to a certain extent, but um, one of the morals of lineage and transmission is let's really practice the basics. Let's make sure that we understand what these transmissions are before necessarily adapting them, right? So we learn our Taiji form. It's a Wu style form. It has these postures. We do this together in this way. If you practice this Taiji form for many, many years and get very deep and look for different perspectives on it, and then you decide that, hey, after practicing this for whatever amount of time, <laughs> um, I, I think it needs to be adapted, then that's your prerogative. But it's sort of not in keeping with the ideas of lineage and transmission to do this too early in your career, and especially not representing it as like, I know Wu style Taiji because I did it with Joe online for 15 weeks and now I'm making my own version and I'm calling it, you know, whatever John style Taiji. Um, this would be a little bit disrespectful, right? So, or, you know, making a new form of uh, movement that you're calling like power Qigong or something like that and marking it as Qigong without having a, a background of where the Qigong actually comes from and what it was initially used for and the, the cultural context of it, right? So um, that's my two cents on that. Um, I don't want anybody to get too hung up on it, but it, if you are in the world of Qigong and Taiji and Chinese medicine for long enough, people, you will come across this idea of transmission and lineage. And it, it, just like Qi, I don't want it to you to think that it's like the secret sauce hidden someplace. It happens all the time, right? We transmit to each other all the time, right? Um, I learn from my, from my students and my patients all the time, right? And from my colleagues all the time. And this is a transmission, right? Um, when you start to learn pulse technique and you start to actually put your fingers on people's pulses, um, the thing that will make it spark the quickest is having a senior practitioner right next to you feel a pulse, then you feel the pulse, and then you describe what you, you're feeling and they describe what they're feeling and you try to get that transmission. You try to get that like, okay, I felt this as flooding, but he's describing it more as slippery. Oh, okay. You know, I felt this more as slippery, but they're describing it as wiry. So, you know, you adjust it, um, but it's this direct nonverbal experience. Um, and of course there's transmissions of, of teachings as well. We're all in the Academy of Chinese Culture and Health Sciences. So we all owe credit to Sifu Tsuiwei, the founder of the school, even if we don't necessarily know what in our curriculum is currently the teachings that he propagated himself. We're learning a different Taiji form. He taught a Yang form. I teach a Wu form. I never learned Taiji from him. I never uh, was a formal disciple of him or anything. So I certainly can't represent myself as part of his lineage explicitly, but I can represent myself as part of his lineage insofar as I'm teaching in his school and representing Chinese medicine, which he also represented. Um, so it's complicated. It's a little bit prob problematic. Um, you know, and anytime we talk about the evolution of culture, we're gonna find things that we liked about traditions and things that we didn't like. And, you know, it's a continuing part of the dialogue of like, how do we adapt what we've received from our ancestors of 
land, blood, and teaching, you know, to our current moment, right? And this is a dialogue we're having, continually having as a culture, right? Where we need to continually adapt and figure out what works and what doesn't and not be too quick to throw something out just because we don't understand why it works yet. Um, we might not be in a place to see the wisdom of that, right? So with that in mind, I'm gonna push this back just a little bit further and we're gonna go through those four basic energies in the context of the Taiji opening of our Wu style, right? Which we just started playing with a little bit. So I'm gonna push this back a little bit. And you don't actually need to see my feet, but let's see if we can find a place where you can see my feet. Okay. Put on my mic. Okay. So I'm hoping this mic is picking things up. Um. We're gonna work on four basic energies or jings or jins inside of our Taiji form. The first one we talked about was Peng, right? And Peng is a sort of holding position where we're light and buoyant and there's a sense of fullness without being stiff. So if I was overdoing it, I'd be like, oh, I'm holding this really stiff frame. If I was underdoing it, I'd be kind of limp, doing it, I'd be kind of limp and like easily moved. There's something right in between where the body sort of inflates up like a ball. And if I was in person with you, I'd go around the room and I'd press everybody's arms and shoulders and back and just look for some sense of buoyant resiliency, right? Where we see this in our Taiji form is at the very beginning. And I want us all to do this together. So go ahead and stand up. We're going to stand with our feet parallel. And I'm showing you from the side because it's easier to see. And then our Peng is our very first move. And we think about it as filling up, right? So the weight shifts forward and we sink towards the ground. And this sinking pressurizes the legs. Kidney one, the bubbling well right behind the ball of the foot. Energy bubbles up and we fill up. And this is our Pung, right? This is our Pung. And it looks a little bit Frankenstein-y or a little bit T-Rex-y, and we're not in our big expressive Pung, but there is a sense that even in this position, we've filled up from the ground. So something goes down, something comes up. This is yin-yang in the body, right? Something rises up and there's a sense of fullness in the body, right? Fullness in all directions. You know, if I was in class, I'd press on your wrists, I'd press on your back, I'd press on your lower back and make sure that there is a sense of central equilibrium. So. We can just do that a few times where you drop down and fill up slowly and then settle. And we drop down, fill up slowly. This is our Peng Jing. And then settle, just slowly emptying out. One more time, we drop in full. The next move is G. And G is a movement from the shoulder blades to the fingertips. So we move from the shoulders, gently straighten the elbows, gently straighten the wrists, and we G forward, almost like you're shooting a little bit of energy out of both fingertips both sets of fingertips, right? So again, from zero, we drop down and we fill up, then we express forward, and that's G. Okay, let's relax, we'll do that one more time together. We're gonna drop down and fill up, and we have G, which is an expression forward. Now we have Liu which is receive, and this is like a waterfall. So from full, ex not almost full extension, we sink to the heels and we glide back. Let's relax. So we'll do Peng Ji Liu. Peng Ji Liu is gliding back. We shift the weight to the heels and we glide back. The elbows traction, the hands, the hands glide back. And then our last energy is on. And on, the best way to describe on is like, you're at a pool and you have a beach ball and you push the beach ball into the water or you push yourself at the edge of the pool to pick yourself up. So let's do those all together. Okay, we have Peng, which is filling, Ji, which is extending, Liu, which is receiving, and An, which is pushing. We'll do these a few times. So we Peng up, we Ji out, we Liu receive in, and we An return to the ground. Peng, Ji, Liu, An, Peng, Ji, Liu, and An. Four basic energies in the body. Way easier when there's somebody pushing on your body partner work, but we do the best we can. In our form, we're gonna see these over and over. The most important one is Peng Jing. So when we hold our play loop position, if we're not, if we don't Peng Jing, we're just kind of like, nah, nah, nah. if we're too expressive, we're like, oh, it's too much. Peng Jing is a sort of filling energy. There's a gentle sense of pressure in all directions without locking things, right? 
And we'll see that over and over in any, almost any time that we hold the static posture for a second, there's a little bit of Peng Jing in it. Okay, so we covered a little bit of talk about the different Jings within Taiji. Um, and this co general concept of Jing, it's a different Jing than essence, although we can think of this as essential energies within Taiji, um, but it's an energetic flavor, right? And we can encounter different energetic flavors in the same external motion. So I can hold this with Peng Jing, I can also hold it with a little bit of Liu where I'm kind of like receiving into myself. Um, the energetic sig signature of each of these moves will not be terribly distinct until you find somebody who has more experience with you and can kind of give you a little bit of a felt sense, but the concepts help and it's embedded in the form. So as we do the form work, we're gonna see opportunities for these jinx to sort of emerge into our activity. And you may find them in your Qigong form as well because they're in there as well. There's different ways that we can um, sort of pluck those out. But very interesting for me is this idea that we have um, a set of nonverbal experiences in our Taiji form that we've come up with descriptive words for to kind of point towards those. And this is a recurrent theme in our medicine that um, we use the terms to point to an experience, right? But this is an embodied cosmology. So really we're trying to look for like, what is this experience in my body? What does it feel like when I hold Peng Jing? Or like, we're gonna talk about Ting Jing soon, which is listening. Like what does really listening mean? Listening with the fingertips for the pulse, listening with the arms for an energy of somebody trying to push you over or something. So a few intro concepts. Um, Please think about them a little bit and also think about ideas of um, lineage and transmission that you may have encountered in your own life, not related to Chinese medicine and culture, but maybe related to China. I mean, I don't know, maybe related to Chinese medicine and culture. Um, and we can sort of have a little bit of discussion about that next time we meet. All right, see everybody on Thursday.